I feel like the only way to properly start this review is to address that Deck 13 invited me to the launch party of this game to publicly spite me for tearing down the original. I say this because a lot of people might think that it affects my rating of the game itself, but those people will be happy to hear they only invited me out there to gank me in a small windowless room and beat me to death with metal pipes and baseball bats, apparently not realizing how well they trained me for that exact situation. So hey, credit where it's due, they finally found a way to make the surge worthwhile. Attempted murder and shockingly resilient glass doors aside, I'm pretty impressed by the directions The Surge 2 has taken, specifically in how hard it's doubled down on making them such a central part of its identity. For those who don't remember, the original Surge was a stamina action game whose unique gimmick was the ability to individually target body parts to either deal extra damage or farm crafting material via interpretive dance. It was a neat concept, but it was also janky and cripplingly underdeveloped, as targeting different limbs didn't affect a solid 90% of the actual combat outside of occasionally rewarding you with less of it. The farming stuff was mostly fine, so it's no surprise that it works about the same here, having just been made more consistent by forcing you to bully the parts enough to guarantee execution instead of letting you waste punch juice on a dice roll based on how many flailing strikes managed to hit the limb you were actually aiming at. Sounds like sidestepping the issue, I know, but it's helped by an implant in the first area that redirects all attacks to your preferred appendage regardless of where they make contact, occasionally sacrificing a bit more damage to ensure that Jonathan Meth gets his rehab. A really nice change, considering that helping the poor guy out is a new way to farm implants and their upgrades, which exists alongside this scour the garbage for PCB you can staple to your brain method that the original exclusively relied on. I think. I refuse to check. For those of you tuning out, don't worry, I'm just getting the boring shit out of the way early, because when it comes to the pipe swinging itself, Deck 13 seemed to have divined that the Surge's combat was bad and opted to make the sequels feel completely fucking different. You're welcome. One thing I didn't expect to happen when I shat on the original was spending the next month translating comments from Acrylic that insisted the only reason I didn't like it was because I was bad at it. So I'd like to take this opportunity to invite the Michaels of the world to eat my ass till they see daylight because even the company that made the game agreed with me. And to rub it in a bit more, they did it exactly how I wanted them to, by refining and rebalancing the good ideas that were already there and disappearing the balance skimp. I mentioned before that I liked this game doubling down on direction being a core part of its identity, and while it may be weird to hear me excited that The Surge doubled down on anything, there were a few things going for it that made it stand out, the bulk of which ironically only served to ruin the first game due to how hard they got smashed by the power imbalance between the player and the enemy NPCs. The most obvious one to talk about in regards to this angle is the Axis-based combo system, where instead of just spamming consecutive light or heavy attacks when you got an opening, you were given the option to mix and match between horizontal and vertical ones to find unique combos and eventually unique wallpaper after getting one shot during a forced 3 second combo animation by a standard enemy for the 16th fucking time. This is also the only part of the combat I'm gonna directly compare to the original, because someone from game design managed to nick me in the temple when I was trying to figure out the locks, so I'm not exactly keen to grade on a curve right now. As you can imagine, a combo system is tricky to integrate into hard hitting high commitment attack animations in a game with a heavy emphasis on positioning without winding up on a list, and if you can't, you don't have to. Now that I've got you fantasizing, here's a quick refresher on commitment. Low commitment animations can be cancelled while high commitment ones can't, at least not without taking a swift backhand. Games typically pick one or the other for the sake of consistency, and while it's not unheard of to mix and match with certain moves or weapons, the Surge is in a weird position because every attack needs to use both approaches simultaneously, which I guess makes it a weird game because they do. Commitment fluctuates back and forth based on damage state, and I'd gladly label that mid-commitment if I hadn't seen the dumb shit you people take seriously or thought my conscience could handle another broken home, so just call it what you like and leave me out of it. You still need to be thoughtful about when to get aggressive, but you don't get bungle fucked by attacks that started after you stopped hitting buttons anymore. It's a simple, efficient fix that would allow them to expand on the combo system quite a bit, and given that every weapon has a country dozen more moves than they used to, it's pretty obvious that was the intention. In the original, combos were all essentially three or four input long strings that terminated in a big attack that either did AoE damage, repositioned, redecorated, or some combination of the three. The Surge 2 takes this idea and expands on it by treating each three or four input combo as individual moves on a simple nightmare flowchart that cycle into and out of one another to create a network of flowing strings that terminate into designated finishers unless they don't. Pretty simple so far, so it's nice that they also added different strings, combos, and finishers based on which particular body part you're targeting that have unique crowd control and damage attributes, or rather that they changed them to be consistent enough that I can actually understand what's causing different moves to come out when I press the same fucking buttons. 
I have to admit, as much as I enjoyed pressing R1, R2, R2 to do backflips for 20 hours, learning that I could juggle small enemies after a parry does approach those dizzying heights. What I really like about this fractal approach to fleshing things out is how much it manages to raise the skill ceiling without drastically changing the game's base mechanical complexity, as I think that would clash with the rest of its design. It also just doesn't really need to, as that's already been improved substantially on the defensive front. You've got the standard dashes and blocks to avoid and reduce incoming damage respectively, but the real standout is the new directional parry system. With the left trigger busy getting fucked up on the good shit and switching targets, Deck 13 were forced to get creative if they wanted more viable defensive options than a tactical chasse, and get creative they did. They managed this by embracing the fact that the Surge's combat is highly reactive, and while that may sound like a bad thing to all the liberal arts majors out there, just pretend I said it's less reliant on foresight if that helps quell the anxiety. In the place of an all-in-one no tears input, the success of your parry also comes down to how well you can read the direction of the enemy's swing and if you have the confidence to lean in and wow them. Holding the left bumper puts you into a defensive stance and flicking the right stick up, down, left, or right will perform a parry in that direction, which is automatically good because having to move into an attack to parry it instead of just pressing a button feels like a physical fuck you, which is what the maneuver has always been about from a tactical standpoint. If it's not plainly obvious by now, this system is fucking excellent. I was worried it was just a gimmick after the first few enemies, since they had a tendency to very slowly and directly telegraph exactly what direction their attacks are coming from, and while I can understand fainting with a semi-truck being a bit tricky, I still wasn't entirely sure how to feel about it. Luckily, this was just a teaching tool, since a quarter of the way in, things have escalated to the point of fighting vanishing wraiths with such a propensity for flourish and fakeouts that you have to stay on guard to keep from getting gutted or baited into a group, another skill highly developed through experience. This is not only just a straight up more engaging version of a parry, but the greater impact it's had on enemy design elevates the entire experience in ways that I didn't think it could when I first started playing. The amount of quick pauses, feints, and directional changes makes fighting a good portion of the enemies feel like squaring off against a thinking, strategizing opponent. It's effective to the point where even the shitters on the social media team who refused to learn how to parry still had to pay more attention to what exactly the enemy was doing. It's admittedly kind of weird, and you could probably argue that the game leans a bit too hard into it, but I can cosplay as a college town intersection, assume the goblin stance, and go full fucking gremlin mode, so you're not gonna catch me complaining about it. Well, okay, you'll catch me complaining about one thing. I alluded earlier to PCB being this universe's PCP, and the first hit you find in the entire game is called the Directional Block Analyzer, an implant that unambiguously tells you which direction you need to parry in and takes the single unique thing about this implementation and turns it back into a simple timing challenge. There's an obvious response to this, which is to just don't dumb shit, and while I agree with that sentiment, the moment you pick up this implant is the same moment you learn this system exists to begin with, which signals to the player that it was designed with this particular implant in mind. I cannot express enough how much I recommend not using this implant. I did for my first playthrough and I didn't notice so much of how well the game is actually designed around the parries because I was busy playing Jigsaw Simon Says. Plus, if you don't use this implant, you're freeing up core power and a chip slot for others that can make your parries even stronger, along with a lot of other cool shit you can do since implants are the game's primary source of progression outside of leveling health, stamina, equipment, and energy. A lot of these are pretty straightforward buffs. Increased energy gains, lower battery drain, elemental resistance, healing assistance, and other gay shit like that. But the system's real strength is how it helps you build out and dictate your own playstyle. If you're intent to show the low level enemies how it's done, you can stack up on implants that increase your weapon impact, let you deflect damage during attack animations, or even slow down time so you don't have to. If you're a parrying combo god, you can make parries temporarily boost your damage and defense, heal you and give you energy, in addition to increasing your attack speed with combo oriented weapons or in general based on damage output and energy gain, as well as healing through quick consecutive attacks. You can even buff your drone, giving it increased damage, energy gain, and ammunition if you drive a vulva. The world is your oyster. This is built out even further with your armor selection, which yes, sounds obvious, cunt, but it does much more than just change your defense and movement speed here. Certain armor pieces have additional stats applied to them, which is a vague way of saying wheels change the cost of stamina movement and doors change attack speed and impact. This varies a bit from set to set, but like most things is more broadly determined by class. 
Operator sets have low defense, impact, and stability, but high mobility and attack speed. Goliaths are the inverse, and Sentinels act as an in-between. I've always been one to value speed and agility over weight in action games, which shouldn't come as a surprise given that I publicly cried for 40 minutes about slow attack animations a few years ago, so I think the fact that I wound up gravitating almost exclusively towards Sentinels and Goliaths in this game should. Being the genius I am, I was able to deduce that this comes down to my preferred method of avoiding damage being to deal it and operators not being able to do combos without getting pile driven into the own zone. It's either that or the fact that none of the operator sets have particularly interesting set bonuses, instead opting for shit like healing on kill or healing on kill with cheese. Yes, in addition to defense, power draw, and stat changes, every armor set has both partial and full set bonuses to reward players for staying on model, and a few of them even matter. They're pretty consistently themed around the class of the set as well. My favorite Goliath set increases the effectiveness of charge attacks and fires a damaging shockwave every time you slam the ground, while my favorite Sentinel set lowers your base damage output but lets you stack it past that point with successful attacks and boost your damage output outright after every successful parry. I'm now done talking about the interesting ones, and one is DLC, so even that comes with an asterisk. Ironically, if this system had just been a little bit worse, I don't even think I'd have bothered to mock it, because having two sets that genuinely changed my approach to positioning and combo priority only served to highlight how much of a waste the rest really are. Here's a freebie for you. Make an operator set with dodge offset, allowing you to continue combos through dodges so that the power scaling in armor classes doesn't so directly resemble a blueprint for Surge 1 fan accessibility. So the combo system has been overhauled, defense has been made engaging, and you're given enough options in fights to keep shit interesting with varied playstyles. But all that still wouldn't be enough to fix the hemorrhage handjob of the first game, so the sandpapering doesn't end there. I know I've said no more comparisons, but I can't exactly not mention the importance of how damage has been rebalanced, because it turns out going for combos and taking a high-risk defensive strategy is actually feasible when Keith from HR brushing your shoulder doesn't instantly send your ass back to the respawn cave. I don't think it can be overstated how important health and damage balancing is to how a combat system operates on a player level, as it drastically alters how the movement and pacing are motivated, and I cannot stress enough that movement and pacing are now motivated in the fucking surge. This change being a two-way street means that combat encounters are much more active on both sides. Instead of standing around and waiting for the enemy to give you explicitly safe openings, you're using all the tools you've been given to create them. Unfortunately, this change being a two-way street also means that a lone enemy doesn't pose the same legitimate threat they used to, since you're not working on a timer and can pussively draw at attacks like before, only now you're playing with stakes approaching your antipode. I imagine this is the reason for what I would probably call the boldest decision made when designing this game's combat. Almost none of the enemies are alone. It's pretty evident that Deck 13 were aware of how easy one-on-one -on -one encounters were for players who hate fun, and given the audience they'd cultivated, I'd wager that was a high-priority issue for them. The traditional wisdom is that combat that relies heavily on a single target lock should primarily be guy on guy, with occasional encounters of two or three enemies thrown into the mix for when you can't be fucked to figure out how to make things more challenging. As a stark contrast, about 10 minutes after finishing the tutorial, the Surge 2 pits you up against multiple enemies, gives one of them a gat, pours tubs of toxic waste on the floor and says, get in there, tiger. And the fucked up part is that it works, because in spite of the Surge 2 incentivizing staying locked on even more than most games, the mechanics provided to you are not restricted to the gormless prick you're making eyes at. Any attack from any enemy can be directionally parried without swapping targets, and doing so gives you iframes, so you're not getting punished for going for the higher skill defensive option when the hits start stacking. This is coupled with the revamped stability system and added dedicated crowd control attacks I mentioned earlier, as these will affect any enemy caught in the hurt box of your pirouettes, assuming you haven't hit them enough to make them resistant to stun locking. All this comes together to make most encounters feel like a match of mechanical skill, game knowledge, positioning, and action response between the player and the enemies, and when you manage the perfect flow state in a fight, it's quite possibly my favorite combat system from a western developer, in spite of them failing to take my suggestion of influencing target swapping with the right stick. All that isn't without its jank, but that's to be expected. Jank is a huge part of Deck 13's identity as a developer, and since this jank is responsible for a fair bit of the fun I got out of this game by creating weird, scuffed combat tactics, he'll probably be safe even after Focus finds out I managed to swipe a top-secret company dossier from his office. 
I won't say the way I approached fights drastically changed after I found out you can repost any enemy in the fight after you parry someone, but zipping across the arena to punch the pussy taking pot shots was fun as shit partially because I clearly wasn't supposed to be doing that. The highest praise a game's combat can earn is that it's revengeance, but a close second is that it's still fun and exciting to experiment with after dozens of hours and still being able to discover new shit by doing so. The Surge 2 owes a lot of this to the fact that it's seemingly attempting to bridge the burn between stamina and character action, to the point of making the stamina system more of a combo limiter designed to reward timing than a tool to punish recklessness. And while this gives its gameplay a very strong identity, it doesn't go quite far enough in some places to fully justify the waning of the grounded and deliberate feel that comes with its roots. You can do a lot of shit with the mechanics and systems provided, a fair few fuck tons more than the first game, but based on what I've seen online, the biggest takeaway has been, wow, his head's over there now, which is a result of the game at no point having the confidence to require engaging with it beyond that. The Surge 1 was pretty typical in its defensive and utilitarian approach to combat, relying on baiting out big enemy attacks and getting a few licks in before dipping out and all that, so shifting into aggro as fuck, gobrimlin, etc, etc, is probably going to require motivating a change in thinking. One way you could go about that is making waiting for an attack, R1 spamming a bit, and then dodging out easy in the hopes that it'll encourage people to play more dangerously. It's a bad way, but it's certainly a way. All you've done here is inform the amoeba that this is safe, and anyone who's spent any amount of time with the Surge 1 is probably going to assume that safety is what the game wants from you. This is one of the biggest hurdles with mixing these combat styles. On one side it's about finding what works, and on the other it's about finding what's fucking sick. I guess it's pretty lucky for y'all that I'm only dealing with mild head trauma then, since I'm more than happy to fix this for you, and all it's gonna take is one more cursory glance at your character action cheat sheet. Now, this game obviously isn't really suited to a traditional style meter or combat rating, but if the idea is to take the strengths from each subgenre and make something new by combining them, then the solution seems pretty simple. Make the style meter directly utilitarian. It's not even hard to figure out how to do that, just have damage output scale with how high you keep the meter. With that done, you can just start another collab with Japan since they've worked most of this shit out already. Make it charge when the player attacks, mixes up their combos, keeps on the aggressive and parries, start draining it for dodges, and tank it when they tank hits. At that point, you can just slap it under the stamina bar and contextualize it in-universe as the Adrenaline or Adderall gauge. You can even write up a little tooltip about how the skeleton boosts you with emergency power when it feels your movements consistently meeting resistance if you're suddenly concerned with that sort of thing. I could go deeper into the specifics, but I've been told to stop analyzing fantasies without a professional present, and that level of detail is better suited to the demand letter than a YouTube video anyhow. My point is, you already got halfway there with the set bonuses for the gimme a second I can explain armor. Just expand on it and bake it into the game system. Stop pussyfooting around this being anime and take the plunge. I guess the silver lining to this system's absence is that even if it had been implemented, it wouldn't be enough to offset the fact that even after firing the GIMP, Deck 13 thought the best course of action would be to orient this game's balance on a fucking Mobius strip. Not properly encouraging the player to engage with all the ins and outs of your unique combat system is one thing, but seemingly going out of your way to ensure that they shouldn't is a fucking nother entirely. I alluded earlier to the fact that your implants and armor class are balanced by their power consumption, which is a pretty sensible way to handle things, so what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that every single aspect of that system is trampled under the cold, uncaring feet of Merkel Mouse. Put the fucking tablets down. I'm not sure whose idea it was to make a Goliath-class armor set that costs zero fucking marrow, but if they're the same fucker who came up with the set bonuses, then I pray to god they were a casualty. On paper, jacked up punching glove impact and stacking attack speed on kills doesn't sound all that bad, unless you stop for the half second it takes to notice that there's no in-combat condition to unstack these buffs, and the fact that you put a punching glove weapon in this game that stacks additional attack speed and stability on hit, making it so you can freely send enemies flying around willy-nilly without getting staggered yourself, or even better, just spam the horizontal infinite since it's a cross combo that deals bonus damage to unarmored parts. If looking at the screen is a bit much to ask, just remember that your bones are unencumbered and you're free to juice up with all the strongest implants the game has to offer. Treat yourself to some healing from damage output, healing from energy gain, overhealing from energy gain, faster energy gain, attack speed from energy gain, and automated healing from attacks that would deal lethal damage. And if you still somehow manage to find yourself in a bind, don't sweat it, because this zero-cost goliath armor set reduces 
increases the stamina cost of dodging. Oh, but that's unfair. After all, this is only arguably the most broken build the game has to offer. We aren't even gonna talk about the fucking spears. It honestly comes all the way around to making it even more impressive just how good the combat in this game is, because you somehow seem to have managed it without any fundamentals. Being able to make broken builds in an RPG can be a lot of fun, but if there's no emergent gameplay and it's not even hard to get to that point, then all you've done is create a fairly deep and well thought out system where spamming one button over and over again is one of the most effective strategies available. While we're complaining, let's talk about the level design's complete over-reliance on shortcuts to the point of redundancy, which probably would have made it difficult for me to map things out mentally if I hadn't spent so long trying to escape their non-Euclidean building where every door, vent, and mail slot somehow managed to lead back to the level design office. Having a central spawn and creating the feeling of progression through unlocking faster routes around the area is a great approach, especially now that the game isn't shoving me into winding vents for 10 minutes and expecting me to applaud when I come out somewhere different, but littering them to the point where some are only there to shave 16 seconds off of other shortcuts both removes the excitement and makes massive areas of the game eventually feel pointless. It gets even worse once you get the force and lifter hooks, because from that point forward, almost every shortcut is created by simply plopping a zipline every 16 feet and calling it a day. Make no mistake, the level design overall is massively improved from the first game. Plenty of areas were quite fun to explore the first time around, and a few shortcut reveals genuinely made me smile. I'm just starting to get the impression they chose Warren's endearing condition based on how much they empathize with the reliance on crutches. If about half of the game's shortcuts were outright removed, I'd probably have a lot more to say about the level design itself since I'd actually have to spend time engaging with it, and if you thought I got through that a bit too quickly, then guess what? You fucking agree. Circling back around, the absolute worst thing about the combat though, without a fucking doubt, is how spectacularly it has been improved while somehow managing to have had no impact on the quality of the game's boss fights whatsoever. There are a grand total of 15 bosses in the Surge 2, and of those I can only really say that 4 are any good, and one of them is from the rip-off Robot Pirate DLC, and that gets nullified by Deck 13 somehow managing to make beating up Robot Pirates a fucking rip-off. I don't know if y'all got insecure about me pointing out the low number of bosses in the first game or something, but the only reason that bothered me was because it was a low number that was still padding itself out by reusing other boss fights and normal enemies, the solution to which is hardly to pad further with 8 bosses that effectively amount to recycled enemies with very slight twists. It's made all the more frustrating by thinking about how the resources dedicated to making these filler fights could instead have been used to give us even one more fight like the Delver. I don't even need to show you footage of the fight to demonstrate how much more thought and work went into him. I just need to point out that he's teased in the tutorial, talked about by several NPCs, and another boss is fighting you so he can be the one to take him down. It takes confidence to hype up a non-final boss this hard, and considering Deck 13's track record and the fights leading up to this point, I wasn't exactly sharing the load. As it turns out, the Delver wasn't either, because this boss fight is so fucking good that it elevates my overall opinion of this game's bosses all the way from dog shit to sub par. It's split into three phases that are distinct from one another, not just in their attack patterns, but in how they force you to think about the fight itself. I don't want to show too much footage or go too far into specific mechanics since, you know, this is a Surge game and I don't want to hamper the first time experience for anyone. When I managed to beat him, I couldn't help but wish that all the other bosses would be like this. And the monkey's paw curled. At random points throughout the rest of the game, you're subjected to three more fights against each individual phase with beefed up health and damage, and if that wasn't pathetic enough, two of them are in the same fucking arena because hey, the environmentalist message hasn't gone anywhere, so I guess we're just doing our part, huh? This isn't even just insultingly transparent padding. It also undermines the experience of the first fight because on its own, the Delver felt like three bosses wrapped into one. Separating them only served to illustrate that it wasn't. Outside of the Delver family, the rest of the boss fights also somehow reliably fail to capture what makes the combat work while still not being different enough from normal combat encounters to feel like bosses. It's such a fucking waste, because you have no idea how badly I want to be able to gush about wildly swinging around a cardboard sign and shouting, sorry god, Jericho is a stand your ground state. I should probably explain that. Which means we've reached the story, and that's very exciting because even after breaking my legs and taking my dog, it's the only thing anyone at Deck 13 felt compelled to apologize for. I think the best place to start with this would be to directly compare and contrast it to the story of the first game. And I know what you're thinking. 
There was a Surge 1? So, as a quick recap, in spite of how shallow a lot of it was, the story of the Surge had some really solid presentation and dramatic beats that were suffocated under a cushion of mediocrity and tonal dissonance. Finding the corpse of a man hanging from the rafters while he lays his deepest regrets and self-loathing bare in a looping suicide video in the hope that someone will survive long enough to witness his final shame is pretty harrowing in concept, but to say that stumbling upon it dressed as Angela sent some mixed messages would be a pretty laughable understatement, and even though it can be hard to tell with German I don't think that's what they were going for. Regardless, it didn't seem like this particular issue would be sticking around, as the game's first DLC was an expedition through a thoroughly fucked theme park disemboweling Samuel J. Soda and company, while the second was an Old West murder carnival that dropped any pretense of seriousness altogether. This dissonance has somehow gotten worse in the sequel, because while the setting broke a bottle over my head and took an impromptu shower in the insanity, the tone sat me down and explained that it wasn't my fault before divorcing from it entirely. And you'd be surprised to one custody, assuming you've paid no attention to how things have been going lately. The game opens with a child monologuing about the fallacious nature of assuming the inherent superiority of machines over footage of the mass release of intelligent nanites into the atmosphere that Warren failed to stop in the previous game's final moments. She continues to monologue about how machines would be ultimately doomed to fail, as they would naturally inherit and fulfill the path of their creators, much like the plane infected with these nanites crashing into the city port below, I guess. One title screen and time skip later, our new amnesiac protagonist, Jonathan Surge, awakens in a prison hospital after two months of being racked by delirious visions of the plane going down and the monologuing child. After skeletonizing and pleading the sixth, one of the local electricity cultists phones you on the radio and tells you to meet him outside, where he gives you your first objective. Meet cult alum brother Eli under the giant octopus for enlightenment, and credit where it's due, that's one of the better cells I've gotten from these sorts. Eli tells you that the plane crashed in Port Nixon, which is his territory, and for him to let you through, he'll need you to kill his shithead drug lord brother little Johnny to keep him from turning this sci-fi cult into a normal one, and for the sake of time, you kill Johnny, Eli betrays you, and after killing him, you find out the little girl's name is Athena Gutenberg, and she's been kidnapped by based Red Cross because of her apparent link to the Nanite Swarm. I'm condensing a lot of playtime here, and if you're mad I won't go into detail about the 15 times she almost gets captured prior to you even waking up, I have bad news, because the first half of this game being written by a looping algorithm and presented by a VR PowerPoint means it's not remotely fucking interesting to talk about, so I'm not gonna bother. Again, you're welcome. Although, if this happened because someone saw what the most viewed video about the first game was and took away that PNGs are exciting, then sorry, too. Once you know she's in the clinic, your modus operandi is to rip out a monster's brain and give it to her grandpa and CEO of Creo, Jonah Gutenberg, who reveals that the nanites have bound to Athena because they're based on his DNA. Up to this point, you've probably been hearing off and on that the Child Relief Fund have been testing a cure for defrag, a deadly disease caused by the nanites, but Jonah's worked in the private sector long enough to know that's bullshit and sends you to their headquarters while he figures out a way to separate Athena from the swarm. As you work your way through Genesis 7, there are a multitude of audio logs and areas in the level that reveal the kidnapped children have been experimented on to find a way to stop the nanites from destroying humanity, and since the flimsy cunts keep dying, the market value of a child already linked to the swarm has skyrocketed. You arrive right as General Shields locks Athena in a chamber designed to capture her energy and stop the nanites, and after beating him, you're treated to a cutscene of a small child being atomized and fired into the black nanite cloud that hangs above the city, causing catastrophic damage and the creation of a gigantic nanite leviathan. Immediately afterward, you find an echo of her remains, and in the voice of a terrified child, it asks, Where am I? What am I? What have I become? And you whisper back, One X large pile of metal scrap. Now, think about all that, and remember it can be experienced in a mouse costume while wielding a weapon that leaves rainbow trails when you swing it because the previous game's protagonist imbued it with the power of friendship, which is also somehow not min-maxing. I've been skimming pretty hard to get here as fast as possible, since we're at about the halfway point of the game and also where every single online outlet stopped bothering to try recapping the story, though I can't really blame them. If the first half was written by an algorithm, the second was written by an if statement that was fed three seasons of Black Mirror and a value select playlist, and I'm going to be talking about all of it, so if you care about spoilers, I promise you don't. Remember those weird cultists you killed at the very beginning of the game? Well. 
Brother Eli's back, and he's phase shifting around like a fucking Devil May Cry enemy now, because apparently his religion is real enough for that shit, but not real enough to protect him from another West Side beatdown. Gutenberg thanks you for saving his life, and tells you that the only way to bring Athena back from the swarm is gonna require a massive power source, and the only thing that remotely has the juice to do it is the great positive and negative itself, the spark. So, naturally, you make your way to and through the Children of the Sparks Cathedral, do some trivia, watch Eli get brought back to life by the spark, again before fucking off with it and kick the shit out of Mommy Magdalene. For your troubles, you get to watch Gutenberg get implied by PNG Eli, meaning that rescuing Athena from the storm is no longer an option and the best you can do is stop Eli from absorbing her. So you make your way to the Great Wall, no relation, where everything is suddenly and forcefully more engaging because the story is now being told in the present via action rather than the past via art station. You make your way up the wall through what has become an all-out war with the remaining AI diesel getting pretty much walked through by Eli and the nanite creatures crawling all over the place. Upon reaching the top, Eli ascends and pulls you into the kingdom of heaven for a final showdown to prevent the rapture, meaning it is now time to kill God. And in spite of all of this, the absolute weirdest thing about the Surge 2 story is still that Warren is inexplicably alive and also a fucking character now. There's no real explanation as to how he managed to survive after, you know, dying, at least not beyond being a hard and tough guy now, so par for the course, I guess. Thing is, I don't give a shit, because his presence in this game does nothing but improve it. You meet him at the first med bay after talking to Brother Truman, at which point he takes one look at your gear, calls you a shitter, and then fucks off till you give him a good reason to think you'll be a halfway decent ally, and his side quest won't trigger until you've done so. Everything with Warren works because he behaves like an active participant in the world rather than a quest NPC. He gives off the impression that he's doing his own shit, won't wait up if you don't show up to help, and most importantly, the first time you walk into his hideout, he's quietly singing to himself, I was born in a prison. Because it's stuck in his fucking head too! Probably some kind of PTSD response, but when I heard that the first time, I put the controller down, I was laughing so hard. And the best part is that this joke made me care about Warren because it made him a person to me. This is a fictional character that I have shared trauma with. That's another thing I like about this game's writing. When it isn't trying to tell this big epic story, it grounds the world by embracing how ridiculous it is with some genuinely solid moments of levity. It's not all gold. Most of it isn't bronze. A solid half of the jokes are pretty dog shit, but that just comes down to Deck 13 seemingly trying to shine as much additional spotlight as possible on the dialogue system this time around since that's where most of the garbage is and for some reason we haven't stopped pretending to roleplay yet. I think you may have gotten the wrong idea when I derided the dialogue trees in the first game, because believe it or not, I wasn't annoyed that I couldn't pick between chocolate, vanilla, and Satan, I was annoyed that you built such a strong foundation for investing me in Warren and then did nothing to build on it, and I'm more annoyed now than ever because I didn't realize you actually knew how to do that. There's a trend in game criticism to pigeonhole dialogue trees as strictly a means of influencing the main story or role-playing your own character, when I think one of their biggest strengths is the ability to flesh out an already existing one. Obvious comparison, but Pathologic does this perfectly. Not only are all of the choices provided to you completely in line with how the characters have been presented, the ones you don't choose still serve as characterization by revealing how they think through the game's systems. These choices do have knock-on effects, but they also serve as narration by letting us into their heads, and narration is an extremely rare and powerful tool to wield in game design or at least a rare one to wield well. I think that taking this approach to the system and applying it to the Surge would finally make the conversations engaging, because every time you make a choice, they must either move forward or end, rather than being weirdly suspended from the world and time around them. Instead of exhausting filler options to find rigid side quests, you're learning about the person you're playing as while influencing their relationships with the people around them, possibly gaining, losing, or getting bad information based on how you treat the people you're getting it from. The ripples can be small and personal, because giving Warren the ability to fuck up and lose both people and control is more compelling than whether John Boy helped Grandma ward off the mob or sold the little orphan girl's insulin to buy Sharpies and got banned from the 7-Eleven. The biggest complaint I've heard about this game is that the story is dog shit, and while I agree, I think that comes more down to shit like this than the actual plot itself. 
The reason I've been skimming through the story so quickly is because there's no meat to it whatsoever, and if you try to engage with it, the bulk of that time is going to be spent staring at static 3D models accompanied by what is effectively an audio log of uninteresting bullshit that already happened and ultimately doesn't matter, sometimes placed mere feet from one another because for some reason we need to be told directly that Athena doesn't want to be atomized, and hear her talk about how her warrior is coming for the 88th fucking time. There is exactly one echo that reveals an even even remotely interesting detail about the story, and even that's a stretch since there's not even a character to associate the interesting information with, so it ultimately still doesn't fucking matter. The part that fucks me off the most is that I want to engage with this story more than the game will let me, and when I try to, all it does is let me down. Earlier in the game, there's a side quest to kill three scientists who have been mutated beyond recognition so that a man who turns out to have the same mutation can make a chip that inhibits the nanites in an attempt to treat the infection. If you let him keep the chip, you later find another of this enemy type while climbing the Great Wall, and behind him is the exact chip he created, which soberingly reveals that the man you met and helped was unable to stop the mutation and you killed him without even thinking twice about it. Except that if you don't do that quest, he's still here with the same chip, and since he couldn't have gotten the stuff he needed on his own, I guess this was never him. And while you may think I'd be immune to disappointment by now, turns out those side effects are no joke. That's not even the worst example in this area, because at a certain point you'll be given the classic hold X to see the story prompt and be shown a new enemy type splitting into two separate versions of itself that fight alongside one another. It's a cool enemy, and Deck 13 clearly agrees since the map is littered with them in New Game Plus. They have a good mix of ranged melee and crowd control abilities that give them the impression of being two sides of one mind working together to beat you. I might call it dance-like if I was a bigger cunt. This is the only enemy in the entire game game that gets this treatment, as the look at the story button is otherwise reserved for bosses, major story events, and a map that somehow manages to get even less useful as time goes on, and when I was wrongfully yanked to the pearly gates, I couldn't help but notice the slight similarities between the almighty and the splitters, and it got me thinking. Thinking about the audio logs where Eli talks about erasing the binary of man and machine to come together as one, how others portray him as a character who struggles with his own duality, how in the first conversation I ever had with him he referred to the spark explicitly as the Alpha and Omega, and how immediately before the fight he yelled about the powers of creation and destruction. And then the fight started. Once I saw attacks that were basically scaled up versions of what I'd been dealing with on the way up, I was convinced. The entire game had been testing my ability to fight against groups, to the point of drawing story attention to a single enemy becoming groups, and still there hadn't been a single boss fight against more than one opponent except for the other fights against Eli, a decision that was clearly made to build up to this. A demonstration of the two warring sides of Eli, his desire for the salvation of humanity contrasted by his capacity for evil born from that humanity, and forcing you to hold your own against both at the same time to prove that you are strong enough to stop the coming tide. I was so desperate to be excited about anything in the storytelling for some kind of reward for trying to engage with it that I managed to completely convince myself that something was surely coming, and it just didn't which I guess might explain my empathy for this character. It would have been pretentious and trite as all fuck, but it would have been hype, and that's what fighting God should be. I can't help but think a lot of this stems from the decision to upgrade from a disappointingly non-engaging main character to no main character whatsoever, because Eli is devouring scenery opposite guy man shape. For all of its faults, the one thing I can never call the Surge 2 story is forgettable. No amount of yelling about dogshit presentation will ever change the fact that I'm still being awoken in the dead of night by hysteric recollections of the spark pilling of Brother Eli, and based on the letters I keep getting taped to my door, I'm not the only one. The story is completely fucking batshit, and it feels like the only characters aware of that are the ones who aren't involved whatsoever. It's kind of amazing, and the more I think about it, the more I realize that I actually prefer this to the bland but competent story of the original. Let me put it like this. The Surge is a game about human greed and arrogance leading to the end of the world wherein you fight an evil crane, while The Surge 2 is a game about trying to prevent a double apocalypse in the hands of a cult and oppressive child weaponizing government wherein you fight God. Neither of these stories is good, but at least one of them is Evangelion. 
the only thing the first game has over the second is presentation. And while that may be the single most depressing category to lose to The Surge, based on a few weird moments hinting that the story was initially meant to branch, I think that probably comes down to time constraints. It also says the story had to be massively rewritten right here in the dossier, so I don't know why I'm pretending this is entirely speculation. What I do know is that I want to see more of this setting. I want to see an insane story like this told right. And while I've learned not to wish, I can be very demanding. Digging a little deeper into that dossier, I stumbled across a little folder labeled The House in Hamburg, and man, even with all that black ink, I gotta say, it was quite the page turner. Now, I don't need to talk about this, and if you want this mystery to stay one, I'm more than happy to bargain, since with everything being what it is, I'm sure you'll understand the value of a little silence. If there is a Surge 3, then I'm gonna need the addition of the Adderall Gauge, Warren as the protagonist, my dog back safely, and any amount of balance whatsoever. Do that for me, and none of this ever needs to see the light of day. And believe me, I don't want it to. Because not only is the Surge 2 a massive improvement over the original, it's also fucking great on its own merits, and that complicates things. How exactly am I meant to go about recommending people potentially crowdfund another attempt on my life? Well, I figure that having my weird neighbor set me up with a Polish mob to hit their bottom line is probably a good starting point, so for the first few days after this video comes out, there'll be a link in the description to buy the game for a quarter of the asking price on GOG, and a chunk of that will go straight to yours truly. We'll call it reparations, and with that, I'm comfortable saying no hard feelings, and I'm sure with time, y'all will feel the exact same way. What the fuck? Is it?